Hello, welcome to the Thursday, December 2nd, 2021 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. A lot of modern web applications are using webhooks. Now, a webhook, simply speaking, is a web application that you're setting up that receives requests. And then you have other applications that basically send data to your webhook to trigger certain behavior. For example, if there's an update on uh, routing for a package or whatever, that application could send a request to a webhook that will then notify a user. Of course, if you are writing software that is sending data to webhooks, well, uh, you need a way to test it. And there is a real nice free service, webhook.site. All you have to do is go to that website and will automatically set you up with a free URL that you can use as a target for your requests and will then basically display the data it received. But like any simple free service, it is being abused. And that's something that Xavier talked about today in his diary. He came across some uh, malware, the hazard token crapper, that will essentially use webhook.site in order to exfiltrate data. All you need, of course, on the malware's end here is a simple post request that sent whatever data you would like to exfiltrate to that custom URL provided at webhook.site. And with that, uh, you're able to exfiltrate arbitrary data. I'm not even sure uh, what the upload limit is here. There's probably some kind of limit, but in this particular case, it really sort of just uh, exfiltrates uh, some data items, like for example, the identity of the computer, but also uh, things like passwords and cookies. So probably not more than a few kilobytes. Well, from a defensive point of view, definitely take a look at the request to webhook.site. There are legitimate uses of this tool in particular for developers, but if you're not dealing with developers, you should not really see any requests to webhook.site. So certainly something to flag and investigate further. And thanks to Google's Project Zero, we do have details regarding a critical buffer overflow vulnerability in the NSS library. NSS, short for Network Security Services, is not quite a household name like OpenSSL, but similar in scope. It's a security library that uh, is assisting particular clients with SSL and TLS and things like SMIME, but you can also find it on servers occasionally. Of course, uh, Mozilla is using it, Thunderbird and uh, Firefox are using NSS, but there are a couple other products like some of the Red Hat server products that are using it. Suzy Linux Enterprise Server is using Mod and NSS actually with its Apache web server. This is a critical vulnerability as it does lead to arbitrary code execution. Yes, there's a lot of details uh, available how to exploit it from the project zero posting. And as with many of uh, these library vulnerabilities, of course, it's up to these different vendors uh, to update their products in some cases. So uh, look out for this. For the most part, this affects Linux systems. But uh, yes, it can also be found on Windows, even though you're probably less likely uh, to see it here. Firefox being the exception, Thunderbird, and also using, for example, OpenOffice. Uh, one particular way how this could be exploited is also with a digitally signed PDF uh, that would then be parsed by NSS and uh, then trigger the vulnerability. And then Lab360 has a good write-up of a botnet that is going after Edgemark Enterprise Session Border Controllers. This is a router voice over IP a modem combo that's used by AT&T. And apparently they're exploiting a four-year-old vulnerability, CVE 2018. 6079 and uh, 
these devices have not yet been updated uh, by AT&T. Now, the number of victims here is relatively small uh, compared to other botnets. NetLab 360 counted 5,700 uh, different uh, victims, but all of them are uh, located in the US, of course, and part of AT&T's uh, network. As an end user, if you have an affected device, there's not really much you can do other than uh, check with AT&T. These are devices that are deployed by AT&T and typically they, I guess, would have to push an updated firmware. The botnet itself is very uh, versatile. It does establish a command control a channel that's encrypted and uh, could be updated at any time. And for more details, NetLab 360 has sort of a reverse analysis of the particular bot that they found. And if you're using YAMF Pro, the uh, mobile device management uh, system that's uh, often used uh, with macOS and iOS, well, uh, they do have a critical update for you, release 10.32, that fixes uh, two vulnerabilities, one with an CVSS score of 8.3. Well, and that's it for today. If you like this podcast, uh, good reviews at whatever podcast platform you're using, I'll always appreciate it and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.